Welcome to the teaching ministry of Bay Ridge Christian Church. This teaching is from the series Game of Thrones, The Reign of David. This series looks at the reign of David in the books of 2 Samuel and 1 Chronicles to learn from David's victories and failures to see how we can walk more closely with Jesus. This morning, uh, our text is going to be 2 Samuel chapter 7. And actually, you can read virtually the same text in 1 Chronicles 17. A few words are different, but it's really, really similar. We'll be looking actually at this text this week and next week because the Davidic covenant is so important. We're going to take two weeks to go through it. So it's going to be a long text, but I'm going to read the entire thing. It's good for us to hear uh, God's word together. And so I encourage you, as I'm reading along, you can follow along either in your booklet. It'll also be up here on the screen. We're going to be talking about the Davidic covenant, promise, and prayer today. And then next week, we'll come back and look and see how Jesus, should be no surprise, Jesus is the fulfillment of the covenant with David. So 2 Samuel chapter 7, we're going to read the entire chapter. Hear now the words of the sovereign Lord. After the king was settled in his palace, and the Lord had given him rest from his enemies all around him, he said to Nathan the prophet, Here I am, living in a palace of cedar, while the ark of God remains in a tent. And Nathan replied to the king, Whatever you have in mind, go ahead and do it, for the Lord is with you. That night the word of the Lord came to Nathan, saying, Go and tell my servant David, this is what the Lord says. Are you the one to build a house, me a house to dwell in? I have not dwelt in a house from the day I brought the Israelites up out of Egypt to this day. I have been moving from place to place with a tent as my dwelling. Wherever I have moved with all the Israelites did, did I ever say to any of the rulers whom I commanded to shepherd my people Israel, why have you not built me a house of cedar? Now then, Tell my servant David, this is what the Lord Almighty says. I took you from the pasture and from following the flock to be ruler over my people Israel. I have been with you wherever you have gone, and I have cut off all your enemies from before you. Now I will make your name great, like the names of the greatest men of the earth. And I will provide a place for my people Israel, and I will plant them so that they can have a home of their own and no longer be disturbed. Wicked people will not oppress them anymore as they did at the beginning and have done ever since the time I appointed leaders over my people Israel. I will also give you rest from all your enemies. The Lord declares to you that the Lord himself will establish a house for you. When your days are over and you rest with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, who will come from your own body, and I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, and he will be my son. When he does wrong, I will punish him with the rod of men, with floggings inflicted by men. But my love will never be taken away from him as I took it away from Saul, whom I removed from before you. Your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. Nathan reported to David all the words of this entire revelation. Then King David went in and sat before the Lord, and he said, Who am I, O sovereign Lord? And what is my family that you have brought me this far? And as if this were not enough in your sight, O sovereign Lord, you have also spoken about the future of the house of your servant. Is this your usual way of dealing with man, O sovereign Lord? What more can David say to you? For you know your servant, O sovereign Lord, For the sake of your word and according to your will, you have done this great thing and made it known to your servant. How great you are, O sovereign Lord. There is no one like you, and there is no God but you, as we have heard with our own ears. And who is like your people Israel, the one nation on earth, 
that God went out to redeem as a people for himself and to make a name for himself and to perform great and awesome wonders by driving out nations and their gods before your people whom you redeemed from Egypt. You have established your people Israel as your very own forever, and you, O Lord, have become their God. And now, Lord God, keep forever the promise you have made concerning your servant and his house. Do as you promised, so that your name will be great forever. Then men will say, the Lord Almighty is God over Israel. And the house of your servant David will be established before you. O Lord Almighty, God of Israel, you have revealed this to your servant, saying, I will build a house for you. So your servant has found courage to offer you this prayer. O sovereign Lord, you are God. Your words are trustworthy. And you have promised these good things to your servant. Now be pleased to bless the house of your servant, that it may continue forever in your sight. For you, O sovereign Lord, have spoken, and with your blessing, the house of your servant will be blessed forever. May God bless the reading of his word. In July of 1776, around this time of year, up in Philadelphia, there was a gathering of the Continental Congress. And during that gathering, They asked a a, a subgroup of men, Jefferson and Franklin and and Adams, to get together and to write a Declaration of Independence, which they did. And we're all aware of that document. And I bring it up because in many ways, that document began a new epoch in Western civilization. Uh, Something new was happening there at the founding of our country. There were new ideas uh, that, were, that were up in the air. But it's also important to understand they didn't actually arise out of nowhere. These ideas had been building really ever since the Magna Carta some 500 years before, and those were actually built upon things that had happened in Greece and Rome millennia before that. So it was a new thing, but it was built on something before. And it was a very important moment. And I bring it up because today's text is like that. It only took a couple of minutes to read through it, but it is really, really important. It's one of the most important moments in all of Scripture. Most commentators recognize this is the high point of the writing of 1 and 2 Samuel, which was one book in the Hebrew canon. Everything up to this point was leading up to 2 Samuel 7, and everything else is a flow out from there. And in fact, Everything that runs from Joshua all the way through 2 Kings, this is kind of the central passage in all of it. It explains what's going on with Israel. But it's important to understand it's not something that comes out of nowhere. We're going to see next week and, and look back, this is actually a restating of the covenant with Abraham. And it anticipates, of course, our Lord Jesus. So it's in the continuity of what God has been doing with his people. So we're going to take two weeks to work through this text. We want to understand what's happening, why is it so important, what does it mean for you and I. So let's dive into our text. Now David today, we've been following him through, he's become king, he's established, and he has a desire. And that desire is to build a house for Yahweh. Now notice in verses 1 to 3, what we see is we're the, the, the intro to this covenant is stressing how David is the king and David is at rest. Notice up here I've got highlighted in uh, the kind of orange color, the king in verse 2, he, and in verse 3, the king. The NIV changed it from saying the king in verse 2 because in English we don't like repetition. In Hebrew and Greek they actually like repeating things. Uh, verse 2 is actually the king said. Three times we're told this is the king. The king is in his palace. The king said these words, and Nathan replies to the king. And notice as well in verse 1, it says that David is at rest. The picture is that after all we've been seeing ever since 1 Samuel, through all of those chapters where David was fleeing, he was with the Philistines, he was working even after Saul had died, uh, and it took all those years for David to come to the throne, and then there's immediately battles with the Philistines, with other nations, 
finally we get here and David's in his palace and David is at rest. He is victorious. He is secure. He is the king over Israel. And it seems like the threats have been removed. And as David sits there in that state, notice he gives what his desire is in verses 2 and 3. I want to build a house for Yahweh. In verse 2, David says, look, this is what I, he calls in Nathan the prophet, who we've not met before in First and Second Samuel, but he's going to be a major character here in this chapter, and of course the sin with Bathsheba, and then actually at the coronation of Solomon, Nathan the prophet is going to be there and involved with that. So he's a big character in the rest of the story. But this is the first time we meet Nathan, and David tells him, I want to do this, and Nathan says, that, that's good. Go ahead and do it, for the Lord is with you. So notice, here's why Nathan does this. He's a prophet, but he initially doesn't hear a word from God. He's just saying, well, this makes good sense. The reason is, Yahweh's with David. He's watched ever since this young guy burst on the scene and he slew Goliath. Obviously, Yahweh has been with David. Yahweh had said that David was going to be the king through the prophet Samuel. So Nathan says, hey, the Lord's with you. So yes, if you want to build a house, that sounds like the right thing. Secondly, as David had pointed out, David is living in a palace that is built with the, the best materials, the cedars of Lebanon uh, and all these things. It's a rich, luxurious palace. And as David scans out, what does he see? The tent that the ark is in. And David says, why am I in a palace and the ark of God's in a tent? And Nathan says, that's, that's a good question. So it seems like this would be a good idea. Thirdly, this is usually what monarchs in the ancient Near East did. When you were a monarch and you came to control, the God you believed had put you in control, you would build a temple for him. So David says, well, I know the true God is Yahweh. I should do this. I should build a temple for him. And Nathan says, makes good sense. And then the final reason is God had actually commanded that the time was going to come when Israel was going to be in the land and at rest, and that's when the temple should be built. This is in Deuteronomy chapter 12. Uh, there are several verses. We'll just look at verses 10 and 11. And the Lord said this, You will cross the Jordan and settle in the land the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance, and he will give you rest from all your enemies. Remember, David's at rest. Around you so that you will live in safety. Then to the place the Lord your God will choose as a dwelling for his name, there you are to bring everything I command you. So God said, when you're in the land, when you're sensing rest, everybody's going to start bringing all the offerings and everything to the place that you're going to build as a dwelling for my name. Well, David and Nathan look and say, well, we haven't built that place. We just have a tent out there. So God said we should do this. So for all these reasons, Nathan says, this makes good sense David, go ahead and do it. Uh, we're going to build this permanent place for worship. Now, at this point in the story, what we might expect is, and so David built the temple. But that's not actually what happens. What we actually get back is Yahweh comes back with the word, but it's not what David expects. If the Lord were going to give a word, what would David expect him to say? Yes, build the temple. But that's not what Yahweh says. Instead, he gives a word of promise, which is actually the Davidic covenant. So notice in verse 4 and 5, we're told, that night the word of the Lord came to Nathan. So Nathan, all of a sudden, he had told David, go ahead. But now Yahweh comes and speaks to him. And he says, go and tell my servant David, this is what the Lord says. Are you the one to build a house for me to dwell in? Now, this is an important moment because Everything made sense. It made sense what David was thinking for all four reasons that I just gave you. But now God gives his word. And God's word is, it may make sense to you, but my answer is not you, David, and not now. It's not going to happen now, and it's not going to be you. And one lesson just as a sign line here that we ought to learn out of this is, you and I need God's word of guidance in our lives, uh, in our church, in our families, because God's ways are not our ways. His timing is very often different than our timing. 
And so things may make logical sense. You may look at it. You may understand and say, oh, this, this seems to be what God is doing. But God's will may be very different than that. And that's exactly what is happening here in this text. And make no mistake, this is an important moment in the story. Because if you remember, Saul, when he became king, was originally humble, was doing well. And then there's the story where he does not listen, he does not obey. And when Samuel the prophet shows up and he has a word from Yahweh, he starts to give his word and Saul cuts him off. Saul stops him. Saul starts making excuses. Saul doesn't want to hear the word of the Lord, and he doesn't want to obey. So if you're following this story, it's a key moment. What will David do? Saul started well, but when his will and the will of Yahweh crossed paths and they weren't on the same thing, Saul didn't listen. And he didn't listen to the prophet. When Saul settled onto his throne, he didn't want to hear what Samuel had to say. Well, how will David respond to the prophet Nathan? How will he respond to the word of the Lord? And here we see a key difference between David and Saul. Saul interrupts. Saul doesn't listen to the prophet. Saul doesn't obey. David realizes his place. And David says, I hear, I receive, I obey. And so God continues on then, and he makes this great covenant promise with David. Notice there are, we're going to, I'm going to roll through actually four parts of the promise today, and then we'll come back next week and look specifically uh, at one part of it. And the first part of the promise is God promises to make David's name great. Notice in verse 9, he says, Uh, at the end of the verse. Now I will make your name great like the names of the greatest men on earth. So see, what's going on here is David said, I want to build a house to make Yahweh's name great. That's what I'm doing. I'm going to build a house and everybody's going to know that Yahweh is great. But what God comes back and says is, no, David, I'm going to make your name great. You wanted to do something for my name. I'm actually going to do something for your name. And what God tells him is, you're not going to be some forgotten local warlord. Your name is going to reverberate down the corridors of time. David is going to become the king by which every other king of Judah is going to be judged. Every king, if they are evil, what is stated? Oh, they were not like David. And if they are good, they will say, this is a good guy. He walked in the ways of David. He wasn't quite as good as David, but he walked after the way that his father David had been. So David's going to become this king by which all of the rulers of Judah are measured. His name is going to continue on. And in fact, one of the most amazing things, I I hope to help us grasp this morning how great God's promise is. David wants to do something for God. And God's response is, thanks, but no thanks. I'm going to do something for you, which, friends, is the gospel and the way the gospel works. And what God says is, I'm going to make your name great. And you want to see how great God's name is? You can go all the way to the last page in your Bible. And Jesus, in some of the last words he utters in Revelation, looking at the new heavens and the new earth, Jesus says this in Revelation 22:16. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to give you this testimony for the churches. I am the root and offspring of who? Think about it. Not Adam, not Noah, not Abraham, not Moses, not wise old Solomon. One person in all the genealogy, and who does Jesus pick out? David. David. Because I'm the king. I sit on the throne, and make no mistake, in the Davidic covenant, it's the David's throne. David's throne is God's throne, and Jesus, through all of eternity, is going to sit on that throne that is associated with David because of this moment right here. David's name will be remembered forever. Secondly, God makes a promise, and he says, I'm going to build a house for you, David. In verse 11, notice, The Lord declares to you that the Lord himself will establish a house for you. I will make a house for you. Now, this is really the central thing going on in this chapter. The word house occurs 
15 times in 2 Samuel 7. Now, I've told you before, it's good to go to seminary, and I learn lots of things, but one thing you can learn for yourself, you don't have to go off very, you don't have to get great education to figure out is, if you look at one chapter and a word occurs 15 times, what's the point going on in that chapter? It's that word. Well, here's the word. It's house. Now, some places you won't notice it in your English translations, like in verse 1, when David's sitting in his palace, the Hebrew word is actually bait. He's sitting in his house. His house, because he's the king, is a palace, okay? And sometimes it's even going to say family and some other words, but the point is it's house. Fifteen times. David's in his house, and he's wanting to build a house for Yahweh, but God comes back and says, thanks, but no thanks, but here's what I'm going to do. You wanted to build a house for me? I'm going to build a house for you. That's what I'm going to do. You don't need to build me a house. I will build a house for you. Now, of course, the house that's being talked about is not a physical structure. David's already sitting in a house. What he's talking about is, I'm going to build a dynasty for you. Your house, the family of David, is going to become the rulers of Israel. And this is what he turns to in the very next two verses, in verses 12 and 13, where he says, I'm going to raise up your offspring. Remember that word. We're going to come back to that next week, the word seed. I'm going to raise up your seed to succeed you who will come from your own body. We'll talk about that next week too. And I will establish his kingdom. And in verse 13, uh, I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. He's telling David, look, I know you've looked, and Saul's family is pretty much wiped out. Saul ruled, and it was all forgotten. But I'm going to establish your line, your house, forever. You are the beginning of a dynasty. And notice God says in verse 13, how long will this kingdom and dynasty last? Forever. We're going to talk about that next week as well because it's a huge contrast. It's not going to last one generation or two. It's going to last forever, okay? Uh, this is what's going to go on. And actually, you know, David's sons do rule for 400 years, which was unusual there. But we need to see that actually the promise is not 400 years. The promise is forever. And we'll come back and talk about how that happens. But notes the contrast with Saul. The very next verses in 15 and 16, God comes back and he's been saying, look, even if your sons do wrong, I may discipline them, but notice what he says in verse 15, but my love will never be taken away from him as I took it away from Saul, whom I removed before you. Your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me and your throne will be established forever. How long did Saul's dynasty last? One generation. David's dynasty is going to last forever. And again, they ruled in Jerusalem for 400 years. There's no other kingdom around there at this time that had that. So that's an amazing thing. But of course, the question is, is 400 years forever? No, it's not. And if you read Psalm 89, if you want something to do this week, read Psalm 89. It's a reflection on 2 Samuel 7 at the time of the exile. And they're struggling and saying, you said forever, we got 400 years, how's it forever? And we'll come back and talk about that again next week and look at it. But so God has said, David, I'm going to make your name great. I'm going to build your house, which is a dynasty. And then finally, I am going to allow your son, who's going to be the next link in this dynasty, he is going to build a temple for me. Notice in verse 13. He is the one who will build a house for my name, and I'll establish the throne of his kingdom forever. The son that reigns after David is the one who's going to build the house for God. And who is that son? Solomon. And what do we usually call the temple? Solomon's temple. Because he actually is told that this is going to happen. And so David's being told here, you wanted to build a house for me. Well, your family is going to build the house of God. It won't be you. It'll be your son. But I want you to know that's not going to happen until I've built your house. Because, friends, here is the way of the gospel. You don't do things for God. God does things for you. 
That's the way the gospel works. And anything you and I do is always only after in response to what God has already done. David says, I'll build a house. God says, no, I'll build your house first. And then, in response and gratitude, your sons might build a house for me. But the gospel is always what God does first. And if anybody is ever putting the emphasis on what we do, watch out. You're wandering from the gospel. Now, David then comes and responds in what is a really great prayer. Uh, and I want us to take a look for a few minutes at his prayer or response. And the first thing to note is, when David hears this, imagine if you're David. You had just the day before told the prophet, yeah, I think I'm going to build a house for God. I'm sitting here in a house, I'm going to build one for Yahweh. And then the prophet comes back and tells you this astounding statement where God says, thanks, no thanks, I'm going to build a house for you, and it will last forever. No matter what your sons do, it'll never cease I'm making a covenant that is about what I will do for you, not what you will do for me. Now imagine if God did that for you, just woke you up one night and told you that. I mean, my jaw would be on the floor. Well, how do you respond? Well, we're told how David responds. If you notice in verse 18, King David went in and he sat before the Lord. He's, he's going into the tabernacle to the Ark of the Covenant, and he sits before the Lord, and then he starts talking to Yahweh. He prays. David responds to God's promises in prayer. Because, friends, the very first way believers respond to God's work and promises is prayer. That should be our native impulse. Now, you may say, I struggle with prayer. I don't Look, it's not about how flowery the words are or anything else. David's going to give us a great prayer here. But... The first impulse you and I ought to have when God does something in our life is to talk back to him. When God speaks to us, we ought to speak back to him. When you open his word and he is speaking to you, the first impulse back should be that we breathe prayer back to him. It is a communication because God has brought us into relationship with him. And that's directly what David does. He turns to God in prayer. And we can learn several things about responding to God and what gospel-shaped praying looks like right here in the text. And the first thing is we have to see how full this prayer is of humility. A defining characteristic of this prayer is humility. Notice how David starts in verse 18. You know, he went and sat before the Lord and he said, Who am I? O sovereign Lord, and what is my family that you have brought me this far? Now, David's starting off by saying there, notice, I'm dumbstruck and I'm humbled. I can't believe I'm even the king. I was a shepherd. I was doing nothing. I, I wasn't trying to get elected as king. I wasn't trying to do anything. One day, Samuel the prophet brings me in. The next thing I know, he's pouring oil over my head, and I'm told I'm going to be king, and here I am. Who am I? How did this happen to me? And he goes on in verse 19 and says, And if this were not enough in your sight, O sovereign Lord, you've now been speaking about the future of the house of your servant. It's not only am I dumbstruck by what you've already done, now you're giving this incredible promise that runs out to forever with my family. Saul got one generation. You're telling me forever and ever, as long as time endures, as long as there's human beings, you're saying my name will be great and my family will be sitting on the very throne of God. How can this be? Why would you make such covenant promises with me? And I want you to notice here, in the covenant, the reason David is humbled is, what's David asked to do in this covenant? Nothing. He's not asked anything. Who's making all the promises? God's making all the promises. Now, it was not that way with Moses. The Mosaic covenant, Israel was making promises, none of which they kept which is why, thanks be to God, the Abrahamic covenant is before the Mosaic covenant. Okay? You don't want the Mosaic covenant, friends. You don't want it. Okay? Here, God's making all the promises, and David says, I can't believe I'm a nobody. 
And you not only made me king, you've now made a covenant and you're making all the promises. I would expect that I would be the one having to make all the promises. Lord, why are you doing this? And I want you to see it's not even just that opening phrase. David expresses his humility throughout the prayer. If you look in verses 20 and 21, he says, What more can David say to you? For you know your servant, O sovereign Lord. In verse 21, he refers to himself again as a servant. David refers to himself as a servant ten times in this prayer. Remember, how did the chapter start? David's the king. And even when David responds, the king goes in and sits down. But see, what David says is, everybody else might look at me like I'm the king, but I know who I am. I'm your servant. And his prayer, 10 times in the prayer, I'm your servant. I'm your servant. I'm your servant. And so, other people may look at me as being something, but Yahweh, I know who I am before you. And that goes on, if you notice, the other thing he does there in verses 20 and 21 is he says, um, what more can David say to you? For you know your servant, O sovereign Lord. Notice the juxtaposition. I'm a servant, and he doesn't just refer to him as the Lord by his covenant name. The word Lord there, which is in all caps, is the, na- the divine name, Yahweh, Sovereign Lord is this phrase, Adonai, uh, Yahweh, where he's saying, you are not just Yahweh, you are the sovereign Lord. You rule over everything. And he refers to God seven times by that name in this prayer. Now, interesting, we'll come back to this next week. That's also the name by which God revealed himself to Abraham in Genesis 15 when God's making covenant with Abraham. Because David's being very well aware, he's receiving the Abrahamic covenant into his own family. And so he replies to God as the sovereign Lord seven times. But what we should learn here is, here's the best way. If you and I struggle being humble, and how many of us struggle being humble? All of us. Pride is is our root sin, remember friends? But we talked about this when we looked at the root vices. What's the best way for me to be humble? Is it to look at myself and try and make myself less? No. The best way to become humble is not to think less of yourself, but to think of yourself less. To put your gaze somewhere else. And so where is David putting his gaze? On God. Because when you see God as he is, humility is not really a problem. So that's exactly what David does. Notice here, the path to humility is not focusing on trying to humble myself, but rather seeing and speaking the greatness of God. So David not only refers to himself as a servant, he keeps referring to Yahweh as the sovereign Lord, the one who rules over all. Others think I'm the king. I know who the king is. You are the king. Now secondly, not only is David's prayer full of humility, it's also full of praise. Because when I'm focusing on the greatness of God, what ought to come tumbling out of my lips? Praise and adoration to God. And so notice here in verse 22, David then turns and says, How great are you, O sovereign Lord! There is no one like you, and there is no God but you, as we have heard with our own ears. So notice here, David is praising God for who he is is. And interestingly enough, if you read Psalm 89, which is a reflection on this, the beginning of Psalm 89 is built off of this, and it starts with this long section of praising God for who God is. Because this is what is at the heart of the covenant. We are astounded by this covenant, and we have trust that God is going to keep his covenant because of who God is, the greatness of God, God's character. And so true prayer is built on praise to God for who he is, his character, his power, his greatness. So notice here, prayer is humbling myself, but exalting and praising God. And this is one of the things in our prayer, and we'll come back to this and applying the word a little bit, but honestly think about most prayer we hear today. Is it focused on God and who he is, or is it focused on me and what I want? It's a good question to ask. And one of the great reasons we struggle in prayer is because we got the focus on the wrong place. Can I tell you with great care and affection, you're not that interesting. Nor am I. We're just not. 
God is. He is worthy of focus. He is worthy of meditation and reflection. And if you want your prayer to flow easier, simply start giving praise to God. Simply start meditating on who God is. And it then flows into thanksgiving. Because this great God, and this is the astounding thing, He's not only great in Himself, but He does great things in behalf of us as His people. And so notice David turns in verses 23 and 24 by saying, And who is like your people Israel? Now we might think that He's going to now praise Israel. Isn't Israel awesome? But the reality is, is Israel awesome? No. No, they're not. Okay, is the church awesome? No, we're, we're not. We're really not. God is awesome, and God, for some reason, has set his affection on us. And that's what David says, the one nation on earth that God went out to redeem as a people for himself and to make a name for himself and to perform great and awesome wonders by driving out the nations and their gods before your people whom you have redeemed from Egypt. So David's reflecting here not really on Israel, but what God has done for Israel. Because you and I give thanks to God for what he has done for his people. God fulfills his covenant promises to his people. And David reflects this when he says uh, in verse uh, uh, 24 that You have established your people Israel as your very own forever, and you, O Lord, have become their God. This is the covenant motto. I will be your God. You will be my people. And David's saying, you fulfilled your covenant. You've done what you promised to do. True gospel-centered prayer is fueled by thanksgiving for God's redemptive work in making us his own. You, you want to know how to respond to what God does? We respond with gratitude because I am astounded that God chose me. Like David, I, I was not anything. I was not uh, setting out to try and figure out how I could serve God. I remember when I first became interested in the gospel, it was just a shot out of the dark. I, I was talking, I met with uh, the youth uh, Friday night, a uh, week and a half ago, and we were talking about testimonies a little bit. And I explained, honest to goodness truth, I got saved because I was chasing some girl into a Bible study. How's that for a motive for God choosing to save me? I mean, what a lousy motive. I just wanted some girl. But, right, God was like, okay, that's good enough. <laughs> and let me tell you, not a prize. Not a prize. Two nights before I got saved, I was so drunk out of my mind that it smoked so much dope, I don't remember anything out of the night at all. Nothing. And God said, I want you. There's only one response to that. Why? I don't even want me. Why? And if we don't understand that, friends, we don't understand the gospel. And if we have gospel-centered prayer, it is full of thanksgiving to God. Why are you so gracious to us? Why are you so kind to us? Why do you care for your people? Why did you care for Israel? Why do you care for the church? Why have you saved me? Why have you been kind to my family? God, I can't understand, but I give you thanks and praise. That will fuel our prayers. The last area that David turns to then, after he's done that, he's humble. Ten times I'm your servant. Seven times you're the sovereign Lord. I praise you for who you are. I give thanks to you for what you have done. Then David's prayer, and only then, turns to claiming the covenant promises of God. Verse 25, he starts, he says, And now, Lord God, keep forever the promise you have made concerning your servant and his house. Do as you promised. The promise has now become a prayer. There's nothing better to do than pray God's word back to him. I have said many times, and I encourage you, pray the Psalms. Just pray them. Just open up the scripture and start praying them. 
pray the promises God has made to you and offer them back. That's exactly what David does now. And the promise of God now becomes the focus. David mentions his house seven times throughout the prayer. Uh, uh, in the prayer, five from this point on, verse 18, verse 19, verse 25, verse 26, verse 27, and verse 29, two different times. Five times as he's talking about claiming and saying, God, do what you said, he mentions his house because that's what it's, the, the promise was centered on. And he's saying, God, I can't believe that you made these promises regarding my house, but you said you're going to build me a house, so do it. Do what you said you were going to do. David wants the Lord to fulfill his word, but notice why he wants him to do it. He tells us uh, in verse 26, do as you promised, verse 25, so that, why does David want this to be fulfilled? So that your name will be great forever. God, I wanted to build a house for you. You said you were going to build a house for me. I wanted to do something to make your name great. You said you were going to make my name great. Here's my response. I can't believe you're doing this, but God, do it so that, in fact, your name will be great. My desire that I wanted in the first place was for your name to be great. Not that my name would be great, but rather that yours would. He wants God's name to be magnified and his fame to spread. And so David has great confidence and boldness in this prayer, but why has he got great confidence and boldness? Because of the character and the nature of God, the faithfulness of God, not because of David's own righteousness. Notice in verse 28, he says, O sovereign Lord, you are God. Your words are trustworthy, and you have promised these good things to your servant. See, there's two dangers we run into with prayer. Number one, we don't want to boldly claim the promises of God in prayer because somehow, you know, I'm putting God on the hook. Well, let me tell you something. When God's made a promise, he put himself on the hook. And so he wants me to quote that back. David is bold. But here's the other ditch that we run into. I'm going to get the promise of God because I've got the right formula and I've got enough faith. Your faith is not in faith. And how much faith did Jesus say you needed in the first place? A mustard seed, which is like microscopic. So what he's pointing out is it's not about how much faith you've got. It's not about your faith. It's about the faithfulness of God. It's not about you doing right. It's about the righteousness of God. Why can we be bold in prayer? Because God is a faithful, covenant-keeping God. What He has promised, He will do. So I have unbounded confidence that the gospel will prosper. We heard last week about all the believers that are in China. Why are all those believers in China right now? Is it because the church has done things so right? We're a mess, and have been a mess. It's because God has promised to prosper the gospel. Why do I believe that God is going to reach into the Muslim world and Islam will not have the final say? Not because we got better marketing, not because we got better strategy, or we got more resources, but because God is a covenant-making and covenant-keeping God. And he has promised on that day people from every language, People from every nation, every tribe are going to be there praising him and glorifying him. And so because of that, I can be bold in claiming that in prayer because God is a faithful God. And that's what David does here. So how do we apply this? And we'll close in prayer. It's a, it's a real simple question for us today which is how do I respond to God's work and promises in my life? Friends, God is directly active in each of our lives. That There is way too much deism even in the church. God's out there, but he's not directly involved. He's kind of, you know, the watchmaker. He wound it up and it's running. That is not what the scripture says. Okay, not with the, God is actively involved and sovereign in every aspect of our lives. And he has made astounding promises in his word to us. So how do I respond to this? 
first, how do I respond to his work in my life? How do I respond? Let me ask several questions that, to kind of flip this around and get us to think through it. When I talk about God's work in my life, i got to go back to remember God's work in David's life is David thought he was going right in which way did God want him to go? Left. God's plan was different than David's. And very often God's plan is different than my own. So here's how I answer the question of how I respond. What do I do when God's will is different than my own? Do I act like Saul or do I act like David? Saul wanted a dynasty. Saul craved a dynasty. And when he found out that because of his own disobedience he wasn't getting a dynasty, he said, I'll fight with God over it. David never asked for a dynasty and was given one forever and ever. How do I respond? Am I like Saul or am I like David when God's will is different than my own? Because I will guarantee you God's will will often run counter to what you want. He does it all the time. He reminds us regularly he is God and we are not. Another way to ask the question, do I submit to God's plans or do I stubbornly cling to my own? Now, I won't ask you to answer this out loud, but let's be honest. It is tough. I mean, I have gotten upset with God when I had my plans and he's not getting on board with them. You know, he's acting like he's God and I'm not. Okay? We can laugh, but you've all done the exact same thing. I've laid there at night. Like, how can you do this? How do I respond when God is going a different way than what I wanted? In answering this question, it's, it's another way of asking it is, do I realize he's the sovereign Lord and I'm just a servant? We, we are not conditioned to do this in our culture. Everything in our culture says, I am the sovereign, the sovereign me. I can go how I want, where I want. Nobody can tell me right or wrong what I should do, what I should say, what I shouldn't. That all runs directly counter to not only the gospel, but the entire nature of reality and the whole universe. But you know what? We have been molded into this day after day after day. You're going to leave here. These words are going to ring out of our ears, and we're going to walk right back out there, and the world's going to start stroking you and telling you you are the center of the universe. And then God has a way of crossing our will and saying, no, you're not. And how do I respond? Do I say, I'm your humble servant, and you are the sovereign Lord? One last part of this question. Do I realize, because see, I can't do this unless I realize this. Do I realize that God's works in my life are always for my good and my best? Who knows that David did not sit down and pray, but I don't like this covenant you made. I wanted to build the temple. David had wanted to build the temple, but whose plan was better? God's. And God's covenant with David far exceeded everything David had asked. Here's the challenge in the rub. When I'm wanting to go left and God is saying you must go right, I have to remind and remember myself that if God is telling me go right, it is always better. It may not be what I thought was best. It may not be what I had wanted, but it is always better. You and I will not get an eternity and say, God, your plan was second rate. Never happened. Never happened. But in the moment, it doesn't look that way to me. In the moment, it doesn't look that way. So how do I respond to that? Now, the other question is, how do I respond to God's promises? God has made these promises in his word to love and to care for you and I, to save us. I encourage us all the time with our children. He is faithful to a thousand generations. When I consider these, how do I respond to God's gracious promises? Um, do I respond in humility saying, just like David did, who am I? Or 
do I respond? Well, of course I get that. I deserve, I deserve a break today. You're worth it, right? Isn't that what our culture tells us? Constantly, you're worth it. This costs a little bit more, but hey. But see, God says, no, the right response is, who am I? Why would you do this for me? Do I respond with praise and thanks for who God is and what he's already done? If you're in the middle of a struggle and it seems like God's promises are not coming true, there is nothing better than setting your focus on praising who God is and rehearsing what God has done. Nothing will build and encourage you to continue in obedience while God works out his covenant promises in your life, like reflecting on what he has already done before. And it's astounding sometimes. God does these amazing things. You remember Elijah? He fights the 400 prophets of Baal. God sends fire out of heaven and smokes them all and does all this kind of great stuff. And then Jezebel says, man, you've made me angry. I'm going to come get you. And what does Elijah do? Runs and hides in a cave. Now, we look at that and say, seriously, dude? I mean, God just showed up. It didn't rain for three and a half years. Three and a half years. God, God fed you by a raven miraculously. You stood up with 450 prophets, and you beat them all, and you did all of this, and now some random woman down the road says she's going to come get you, and you run off like a little scared puppy dog. Who does that sound like? Us. Because how quickly do I forget what God has done? As quickly as Elijah did. The smoke still rising from the fire of God, hitting the offering, and Elijah's forgotten. And I wish I could say I'm not the same way. That's why we've got to rehearse what God has done. So, and finally, do I boldly cling to God's promises in prayer? Do we, we, another reason that we struggle in prayer sometimes is our prayers are so watered down. We don't want to ask God for what God's told us we should be asking for. We don't want to be bold because, again, I don't want to put God on the hook because I'm afraid he might not come through. And then I look bad because I prayed for it and it didn't happen. I know y'all have never thought that, but these are confessions. <laughs> confessions of a preacher, okay? Do, do, do we boldly claim the promises of God? Because, friends, he is faithful. Now, what we're going to do today, why don't you, I want you to stand with me, and we're going to take a moment here, and uh, I'm going to pray and I want to encourage you, my, my prayer is not going to be extempore right now. Uh, I'm actually doing a prayer that I meditated on this passage the other day and then kind of wrote a prayer of it. I want to encourage you, sometimes if you don't know what else to do in your quiet time, take a prayer and write it down in your own words. Spend time going, man, there is, there is something about just writing down biblical prayers and personalizing them. So I want to encourage you to, to do that. On, on your own. And let's pray together now uh, to ask God to do these things in our lives. Hallelujah. Father, we can easily identify with David. We make plans, and then we often find that your plans are different than our own. But when we see your great promises and plans for us, like our father David, we can only stand amazed. For your plans are always exceed our own, and your promises are so great that our minds reel. Today we come to, hum to you in humility, saying with David, who am I that you should deal so amazingly with me? For you are the sovereign Lord over all. You are full of power, majesty, wisdom, and righteousness, and I am but a humble servant, fallen, flawed, and wavering, even in my best attempts to serve you. How great you are, O sovereign Lord. There is no one like you, and there is no God but you. And O Lord, who is like your people, the church? which you have redeemed from every nation and across the ages to be your holy people, fulfilling your covenant and that your name might be praised. As your people, we give you thanks for the great salvation you have given us and for your great covenant promises 
which you have kept. You have made us your people, and you are our God. And now, O Lord, we have boldness to come, asking you to keep all your promises and plans for us. Do all that you have promised. Protect us from our enemies. Cause your word to prosper in and through us. Strengthen us by your Holy Spirit that we might walk in righteousness rather than dwell in sin. And bless us to a thousand generations. Lord, we are bold to claim these promises, not because we are righteous, but because you are. Not because of the amount of our faith, but because of your great faithfulness. Not for our glory, but for yours. For you are good, and you delight to do good for us. So Lord, we ask that you would do all of this, and even more than we can ask or think, through the name of Jesus, David's greater son. And God's people say, Amen. So be it. Now may the Lord, the God of your fathers, increase you a thousand times and bless you as he has promised. Go in the blessing of God through Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you for listening to the teaching ministry of Bay Ridge Christian Church. For more teachings and resources, please visit www.brcc.church.